welcome everybody to the second um, Pick and Mix session. I uh, trust you all enjoyed the first session. Uh, I'm Sam Gammy. I'm a farmer councillor in the eastern North Island region, uh, farming east of Ekerahuna. Uh, we've got until 20 to 1 here, so that includes time for questions uh, at the end, and then it's lunchtime following. Uh, so I'd like to welcome up Professor Steve Morris. Um, Professor Morris's research interests in all ruminants with a focus on beef cattle and sheep production, including maximising ewe lamb breeding performance, twin and triplet lamb survival and growth to weaning, alternative feed types to improve performance, maximising lamb growth post weaning, efficient beef cow performance, uh, breeding from heifers at two years old, uh, yeah, two years old of age. Um, but today he's going to be talking to us about the use of Wiltshires to reduce uh, farm costs. Thank you. Good yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, I was asked to speak on this and um, I hope all the people who love Will have left the room. Uh, so we can really not have any nasty questions about that. I mean, Will funded my schooling funded my university and everything, so I'm not against Wilt. But uh, w we started this project last year and there's a big team of us involved, uh, as you can see up there. Yeah, so why Wilt Um well, well, you can see there the, um, the price of coarse wool, which is the black line, you know, greater than 35 microns, has declined. And OK, I'll, it's bottomed out on that slide at, uh, at $2.50, but you, many of you got under a dollar last year. So you know, it's not much fun. The other prices haven't really taken off, but uh, they've been fairly consistent. And just understand also, because when we, when we talk about the alternatives for wool, do we go fine, do we, go, do we not have wool, uh, there's the price differential for... 15 micron wool out to, when you get out towards 35, the line flattens, which is what most of our Romney crossbred sheep, probably 90% of our flock is out there. Okay. And then look at your incomes. Those of you who were around in 1989, 90, look at your incomes. If we take North Island Hill Country, okay, so we're up in Hunterville. 34% of your income in 89-90 season for, was from wool, 23 from sheep. Come through to 16-17, 5%, 45% from sheep and other things. And we're down to 3% and 46 from other things. So wool is not very much contribution to your income. And so I contacted a few mates, a mate in Ireland. I said, what's happened to your wool? Compost or burning it? OK, Scotland the same. Uruguay don't have any crossbred wool now. They've all gone down into the 20s. Okay, so we're one of the few countries with a big pile of crossbred wool sitting in our sheds. And there it is. There's the, real, the main reason, you see. The wool's got a small segment of the textile market. Here we have cotton, fairly consistent. There's the green line of wool, and there's the chemical fibres. You know, unfortunately, the jacket I'm wearing. But I mean, if you go to the next one, hopefully it's the price. The reason wool's never really taken off is that its price has been far beyond, sorry, far beyond what uh, cotton or the polyester or chemical fibres are, so it's cheaper. And still, 90% of the world buys on price. Maybe 95% of the world buys on price. So we've got an expensive fibre uh, that no one wants to buy. And so our sheep numbers have declined and our wool production's declined. And OK, there is some great work going on to try and make, find a use for our wool, but we've still got 100 million tonnes of it. <laughs> you know, so you can spin a bit, you can make some blankets, you can do something, but we've still got a heap. 
You know, you can have put a carpet in some of our houses, but you know, it's you can't re-carpet every building in New Zealand every year to use up that 100 million tonnes. We've got a, we've got a bit of work to do if we're going to do that. So, and the other thing that's happened is shearing costs have gone up. You know, the, from 2004 to 5 to the 2018-19 season, they went up 73%. So they're probably now up 100% shearing costs. So it costs you to harvest wool. I love this photo on the on the um, on the right side. I had to put her up there, um, competing at the uh, Golden Cheers, Sarah Goss, a few years back before she turned to a rugby player. And we haven't really changed how we handle our crossbred wool, have we? Still big bales. It's still piled up. And you think of the end use, it should just go straight into a container at the wool shed, shouldn't it? And never be handled again until it gets to the factory. But yeah, we just carried on with bales, st stacked up. And so there's another cost. So I'm glad Matt was before me. The previous talk, he talked about digital twins. So we did a model as well. So we thought, OK, what's the options? Do we go fine or do we go shedding? because there are some shedding sheep in New Zealand and in the world. So we, d we set up a model on an East Coast, North Island Hill Country farm, and the first one was we graded up transition from Romney to a fine wool second cross, in other words, a three-quarter quarter merino who, f who flattened out around the mid-20s, 24, 25 microns. And then the second model that we set up, using the, sorry, the same model, but the second scenario was grading up to a fully shedding first flock of 15, 16 Wiltshire, 1 16th Romneys. And it was a PhD student, and she's actually gone off to Ireland to um, help the Irish sheep industry now. But she did a great piece of work. So the Merino option took seven years to get to 26 microns and 10 years to get to 24 microns. So you want to change, you're in for the long haul. Okay? And it was profitable. 12 years was 26% benefit, benefit, benefit of the Merino crossbreed over the base flock. OK, so it's on to change the merino. And there was one or two people on the drier parts of the North Island considering it. But when you come to the wetter North Island hill country, maybe merino is, is not the answer. But there are people considering it. And certainly uh, around the country, there's plenty of people considering changing. The wheelchair op option, when we modelled it, it took 15 years to achieve and again, we had to find the data to put into the model. So these models are no good unless you've got data, real data from farms, from uh, collected over a number of years, or from research stations. So it took 15 years to get to the fourth uh, cross that was fully shedding, based on the information that we could pick up from around the world and in New Zealand. And the net present value of the transition flock after 15 years was 7% higher than the base Romney flock at a $2.15 greasy wool price. At $1.15, which is what it is now, actually wool's gone up, and it? It's gone up about a dollar in the last 12 months. At $1.15 where it was 12 months ago, it was a 12% increase. But the interesting thing was, we reckoned on this model, wool had to get out to $4.15 before you made any money. So it has to go up a fair bit with the current day costs, et cetera, which are also going up at 2 or 3 or 4%. OK, so wool has to get a break even. Greasy wool above 35 micron has to move out towards that $4.15 for you to break even with your sharing costs and all the other costs that you associate with wool. So one of the problems was that the model lacked data on the fully shedding sheep or fleece shedding sheep. Okay, we didn't know much about production levels. There wasn't a lot collected. What were the costs occurred when you go through the grading up process? Because when you as you all know, change your farm business is a cost. Change whatever stock policy you got, there is a cost. We often don't think about that. We only think about the end point. So there's a cost to go through it. If you're going to go out of wool, you've got to have to have lamb because that's your main product. So, you know, what happened to lamb? What proportion shed at each back cross? Are there other benefits such as animal health or welfare benefits? 
and maybe there's benefits in the skins, unblemished, it's never been shorn, never been touched. So maybe there's some benefits there. So we set up, about 12 months ago, we set up a flock at Riverside, which is about 10 kilometres north of Masterton, and we made it in, in uh, the autumn of 2020, Wiltshire, across Romney. We've got the progeny from that, which we have now, which are half Wiltshire, half Romney. They have now been mated back to, to Wiltshire's to produce lambs this coming spring, which will be mated in 2022. They'll be three quarters which will produce lambs, which will be mated in 2023, which will be seven eighths, and then 15 sixteenths. You see how long term it is to do all this and to get some data. So, you know, I should be talking in four years' time when I've got the data, not now, but I was asked to talk today. So I'll give you the results from First Cross and where we've got to so far. So, so we started with 400 mixed age Romney ewes that went to the Wiltshire Rab and 200 that went to the Romney Rab. We only went down there because we didn't, we self funded this, no one wanted to fund this, you know, because wool is such a sacred thing. No one wanted to fund this trial. Um, so we didn't, we, we, we had less rom on this side, we actually ad added some Romney hoggets that weren't part of the trial to make the numbers up for the first hoggett mating, okay? But we've generated some lambs. And right now, in fact, on Friday, they went to the entire ram. Uh, there was 240 half Romney, half Wiltshire's went to the ram, and we, 200 ewe lambs of, of um, Romney breed went to the Romney ram. So we're going to compare them through this coming lambing as hoggets. So, what about? the 2020 data, where have we got to? So litter size, remember these are out of Romney U, so Romney, Romney, one point, at scanning 1.78, 1.72, nothing, no difference. So we're not gonna lose anything there at the first cross stage. No difference in survival, or you might notice two or three percentage difference here, but they, they didn't all die. They're happy, they're all alive, okay? Birth weight, no difference. Docking weight or day 30 weight, no difference, 14, both around the 14 and a half, 14 and seven. Weaning weight, no difference, 28.5, 28.9, so we're happy. Growth, birth to weaning, which is just the difference there, 255 versus 262, so they grow, there's nothing wrong with them. They're good looking sheep, they're happy sheep. Yeah. I think, Steve, uh, that these hybrid bigger than those figures. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's all those things in this. Yep. And so you might say they should have done better than that. But you might also say that maybe the Wiltshire breed hasn't got as bigger numbers as the Romney, and the Romney has been selected up so good to be so good. So you can't sort of tease that out. All right? Hello. Steve, just a question. Um, how have you managed the two blocks? Are they run together? Yep run together, except for mating, of course. <laughs> uh, and then they run together all the, all the way through. All right. yeah. So our first thing, and we were a bit hunting in the dark here because the literature people said they shared and no one sort of told us when we should score them or whatever. So we, the lambs, came in for weaning on the 26th of November, so we thought we'd shed them, uh, score them, the ewe lambs, not the male lambs, and only 2% were showing any shedding. We scored them on a scale of one to five, where one is wool over all the main growing area, a quarter gone, 50% gone. So this is a score that we're gonna consistently use. And it's sort of tied into this one, which is developed by a guy called Scobie, and, Christchurch, where you know less than one is where the belly is gone, then you move up sort of through here, then half gone, then three is right up there, four is right up there, and four is almost where there's a tuft along the back. So we've got that scoring system, but weaning time, 26th of November, too early to tell in the wild wrapper. Maybe okay up north. But that's what they looked at. So the vet part of the team says, oh, neat, easy to blood sample. 
the starting to go just under the neck. So she was really happy at the vet. So the wool was just starting to go around the neck. But you could actually see signs on the belly on some that were starting to go, OK? But that was pretty minimal. So then we took the ewe lambs. So the males went out of it, although I'll come back to the males, a small percentage we, 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 we followed through the slaughter. But the, we didn't have the money to look at all the males. Hopefully we'll get money later on to, to do that a bit better. So we took... So this is a ewe lamb, so lighter than that weaning weight before, which had both sexes in, and their weights all the way through to when we put teaser rams in on the 10th of March. So we did teaser rams for three cycles to see if they reached puberty. 39, 43, and on Friday we weighed them and they went to the ram 46, 44, and their growth from weaning to mating there. So that data's just come in. And it sort of hasn't been statistically analysed, you know, because I got it late Friday and couldn't be bothered doing it over the weekend. I hate to go and watch rugby at Fielding. Fielding beat Vasty. Terry. <laughs> OK, so that's... But we were happy with that, as was the farm staff. They thought they were nice-looking cheap, and they got through to mating, and they were happy with them, which was part of the exercise, you know. The farm, the farm staff had to be happy with them. And they, we scored them on the 21 January as well. We went down there and on the 1 to 5 scale, they scored at 0.32. 40% were showing signs of setting almost exclusively just on the belly or up around the neck. All right? Nothing in the Romney as you expect. And there's some pictures of them. So that was the typical shedding in the first cross, 50-50. 50, 50, 50 Wiltshire. We dag scored them. They had less dags. So we're going to do that from now on all the way through all the crosses. We're going to DAG score because that's one of the things that will come through. And so uh, on a DAG score of naught through to the horrible looking ones, which not even, no one with Romneys has those, do they, at that score nowadays. Uh, but anyway, there we had uh, Romney, average score 0.97, and we had a few out at three, 3%. On the Wiltshires, we had none out at three and a few out at two, eight percent, and there they were there. So we dag scored them there that day. Of course, I do have a bit of history with wool, so we took the wool and sent it off to the lab to get analysed. Fleece weights shown on the 10th of February, 1.97, 1.75. So as you'd expect, Romney's got more wool. They start to shed at that stage. So 0.2 kilograms, which wasn't much at a dollar, 20 cents, but now at two dollars, it's 40 cents extra to the rompy. Fibre diameter, no difference. Clean yield, no difference. And no difference in whiteness, OK? The lower the score, the whiter the fleece. So nothing in the wool other than that 0.2 kilograms. So puberty, marked by the ram, OK? a suggestion that it's reached puberty. We don't know for sure. We haven't done hormonal things, but whether it's marked by the teaser ram. And this is cumulative percentages. So the period 10th of March to 27th of March, 2% of the Romneys showed signs of being marked or had top crown marks, so had been marked by the teaser, 2.5% of these. The next period, the next 17 days, 22 33%. And by Friday, 74% of the Wiltshire Romneys had been marked by the teaser ram, and the entire ram went in, and 53% of them. So we're hopeful we're going to get a whole lot of three-quarters lambs out of these things. So we're, we're, we're enheartened by that, that we're going to get a lot of lambs from these hoggets. Luckily, Lazar over the road here came to the party and said, we want to look at the skins, and we said, good, because we ain't got any money to fund any of the male lambs. So they took 10 Wiltshire Cross and 10 Romneys and brought them up here to their little plots over there uh, down by the DSIR and took them through and stored them on the 8th of April so they could get the skins. We haven't got the skin data back, but they're going to do analysis on the skins. So the live weight 26th of November of those lambs that came over here, their live weight at slaughter, uh, their growth rate, their carcass weight and a higher dressing out percentage, which surprised us. But those of you who have 
um, experience with wheelchairs might be able to say that's true and that's what normally happens, but we'll have to do that later on as we get more numbers and we've got a bit more money to be able to take them through and do that. Uh, but the skins, the pelts have gone to Lazarus for them to analyse uh, is there any difference and, and we'll do that all the way through the three quarter wheelchair, the 7 8th and the 15 16th to get the skin data on them. Parasite and foot score, we're going to do that as the animals get older, mainly at the to-do stage. But we did do a feet leg count on lambs on the 13th of November and there was no difference between the vulture versus Romney. The plan is to carry that on as they get to the to-do stage. And we also want to do a foot, foot score on, at the to-do stage as well. Uh, so we'll score each one of the to-dos for feet, feet structure soundness. We'll have the vet do that for us. Uh, Someone brought up in the previous thing about individual animal, well, I've gone, individual animal uh, health and welfare. So we actually ha do have some monitors uh, going on them to do heat stress, okay, so they lose the skin, or cold stress in the winter, heat stress in the summer, cold stress in the winter. So we're, we're going to put, um, compare the skin temperature and quantify any thermoregular differences between the two breeds. So we've got dart loggers fitted to the tail. We made a bit of a mistake. Oh, I shouldn't say that because I was just standing there watching at docking. We've maybe docked a bit too short a tail and so the dart, some of the dart loggers fell off. So we've got to leave a bit longer tail for the dart log to stay on. Which I guess when you get to the full wheelchair you have a long tail. So you can easily attach them. Um, so we're going to temperature record uh, at skin and conduct a series of studies over the next few years to, to see if there's any, this is the health and the welfare between the two types, whether there's anything there or not. And, you know, it's back to the marketing that Melissa was talking about, you know, it's a welfare-friendly sheep. No wool, nothing doesn't get dragged across the board and shorn. Maybe there's a story there for someone. So this coming lambing will follow on. Mothering ability is something we'll do. So we didn't do it the first year because there was no, you know, they're all Romney mums, but now they're, half of them are half, half. So we'll now do mothering ability, score them at, as we tag them at birth because everything's tagged at birth. So we'll do a mothering score there on a score of one to five. Uh, lamb survival, lamb growth, hoggart, we'll do the right, the hoggets that are lambing, we'll do there shedding score early because they tell us and everyone says that we'll probably do that at docking and again at weaning so we'll do it earlier in the spring and at the normal time and then we won't do the lambs in November, we'll do them in, in their lambs in November, we'll do them in January. But the hoggets themselves we'll do at docking and we'll do again at, um, at weaning in, in November and then again in January when we do their lambs. When they're to do So that's where we've got to down there. One thing, the, 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 doing the hoggets at docking, I do notice the docking when we shed, uh, we draft off the shedding ones, they're the ones that lost their lambs. Yeah. And um, so, I, yeah, it's just a question around the yeah. and the environment will affect it. Yeah, yeah well, it'll be interesting that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll be able to correlate everything, you know, the ones that have shed more at docking, what is their lamb growth? We'll have all of that. Okay. Steve, uh, no, no question here. Um, are you going to continue to make um, or cross uh, the Romneys to continue to bring through uh, more um, of the earlier crosses so that you can build your numbers up? Or um, are you just going to follow that initial cohort of new hobbits through yeah. The answer is we're not allowed to change the whole flock because we haven't given the money to do that. You know, because every every sheep we pay a dollar a week to do the research on. Okay, so you know, there's a financial limitation to that. We are going to have a, a reasonable cohort though of each age group, and when we get up to, I think we don't go because we had to apply for ethics and had to plan all this out. We're going to foretooth comparing foretooth halves against fulls, and then we'll drop them out because we have a whole lot of three quarters coming through 
and we'll stop at the fo at the four two stage if you like. Follow me. Yep. Yeah. But we're not changing the whole flock at the moment. We might be able to convince the farm staff and the people that run the farms that this is a good way to go. It'll be just like convincing the industry, won't it? So that will be a real test, actually. If we, could, if we in three years' time, they say, oh, we want to change everything now. They incidentally wanted, we, we changed the rams. Obviously, we didn't put the same rams over their daughters. And they wanted to use the rams on their... Um, Coal mob as terminal size, so they were inter they liked the ra the progeny. So that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Yeah. You haven't looked at the feet yet. Did you look at the feet of the rams and the feet of yep. the rams? Yeah. The, the, the breeder of the rams was look, was very particular about the feet. Steve, uh, how do they go with facial eczema? Uh, uh, the, 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 the maternal side of the flock is, is, is lankal based, so it is facial extra tolerant. And the rams are coming, uh, your flock? Is the, the wool chives that we got uh, is facial extra as well. Oh, okay. sure. No, it's further down the back there. Steve? Just um, what information have you got about? Uh, the shedding sequence of, of pure wiltshire lambs because I'm just thinking down the track when you get a 15, 16 mob and you're sending lambs to the works post weaning, mm -hmm. what stage of shedding are they going to be in and will the works accept lambs that are still got half the wool on? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that about in terms of the works. Uh, and, and our modelling, it's actually very difficult to get those shedding you know, data of, so we had to draw distribution curves of how many are in each, how much shed, and most of it has come from Britain, and it's the, it's the Wiltshire Horn, you know, they've got really, really good data on it. In New Zealand, they all went to, the man who, who started the Wiltshire flock, they all went to, the ones that shed went to hobby farmers, and the early Wiltshires went for lamb production. So it's sort of just come in. It's not a lot of good data in New Zealand. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking there's two things. First of all, it's the practicalities of the works. Either if they accept lambs that have still got half the wool on, you know, yep. parts of the sheep. And also, you, you made the reference to better um, pelt quality, yeah. uh, which um, you think would be right if they hadn't been shorn. But you know, if you do have to shear them yeah. or clean them up, then that could negate them. Sorry, to go back to when we modelled it, uh, what Lydia found was that you still had to do some shear at the F, I call them F2s, but the three quarter and some at the seven eighths. It was not until you got to the 15, 16 that you didn't have to shear any of them. I guess if you selected lambs straight off their mums and they hadn't sheared by November, December and you were killing them then, but that's plenty of woolly lambs going in at that stage. So, yeah, as you said, it doesn't matter really. Excuse me, I can answer this question. Yeah. Um, in January, you probably won't have any wool on the sh and these ram lambs at all. In the yeah. There'll be nothing around the backside. Not nothing that you just can't just pull off and will just disappear. I don't know why I'm finishing. Mm -hmm. We'll keep the questions going. I've just got two more slides. Yeah, so it would be best to go back because the next slide is the next phase of this thing. Can you kind of keep your options open? I mean, yeah, before they shed, could you still shed it? Before they shed, could you still shed it? Yeah, you can shed it for the price No, lambs potentially, but the adults, they're starting to shed, they're starting to shed uh, in September, October. So you sort of... Hmm. It's not well, it's when you need them to. Well, uh, do you, are you going to be parentage and put some that raw data on, a, on an analysis so that you're not parentage? Um, no, is the answer for Riverside. But the next study, yes, I mean, which I'm just going to the next slide. No, ex agreed. But the numbers are too small down there at the yeah. 
but that's probably a good point to segue into this one. So up at Limestone Downs, Port Waikato, we have a big flock and we've managed to get some money to do something up there. Because the other thing is, the big worry is that you grade up, you lose all the good things of the Romney, which you know might be ammonia, might be a whole lot of different things that the Romney have been selected indirectly for over the last 30, 80 years. So up in LD, this one's drawn, driven by Doran Garrett. We've got a separate study underway where we put where this in March 1800 Romney type ewes have been bred to Wiltshire rams. And the aim there is to determine where, the, where on the genome that shedding occurs, which is a bit of a new first. Okay, so where on the genome can they, is actually the, the site that's, that, 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 that shedding occurs. And once you've found that, and they don't know where it is, there's no, none of the sequences, no one has done that. So not, once they've found where it is, they can then, and they, they do that when you cross F1 males to F1, F1 new lambs. Okay, so it's a different way of what we've done. We've gone, got the first cross, and then we've gone back to the Wiltshire. Here they're going to go F1, F1, and then sequence the progeny. And then they can find the site, and then they can, then they think, then they can back cross and keep all the Romney if, if they think they've found the site. I don't know whether I explained that well. There might be some other gene jockeys in the room, but you know, it's 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 uh, it's where they're at now. And you could actually do the same for merino if you want to breed merino in, you know, which is which is actually perhaps even more exciting if you could keep the Romney traits of being in wet hill country but still get a fine fleece. I mean, you think of that. Well, they've done a lot more royal checks. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think it's, it's pretty helpful where it's a fairly isolated gene, mm. where it's the term for all along. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's what Garrick and his team are going to come up with, you know. But that, I mean, that's, that's a costly piece of research. You know, we reckon for that, this project is going to cost a million. And to be of benefit, we really want stud breeders to be part of that as well, you know. So, you know, so that we've, we've got going on at, at, at the same time. But, you know, we, where do you find a million? Yeah. Uh, just a weird question. Uh, we've just started in uh, Wiltshire's and so we're in sort of a parallel flock, same as you. And I've just noticed that in the heat of the day, <coughs> the Wiltshire's are out there, you know, the few Wiltshire's are out there grazing and the wool is there. Sheltering yeah. part of the sun. I just wonder if you're doing any yeah. anything about that. Yeah, there. Yeah, so we, we, we'll have temperature on them, and, and um, the, 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 the data loggers will tell us where they go and all that. Yeah. So we'll, yeah, we'll definitely have that. Renee Corner is doing that, and so she's, she's done a one stint this autumn on the male lambs actually that got slaughtered when they came over here, but she will. We, we actually feel it would be better to do it on the older sheep than, than, than on lambs, you know, so we'll do them on two deuce or four deuce, yeah. Yep, definitely come up with that. Uh, so, you know, I'm three years too early giving this talk, and I hope I'm around in three years. <laughs> That's why there's a big team here. <laughs> um, so, to date, there's no difference to weaning. We had to wait to January to do the shedding score on our lambs, certainly on the uh, first cross. Slightly less wool. I put that in there because I made this, I had to make these slides a week ago. Onset of puberty seems okay. <laughs> okay, that should be another few words after that. Okay, so onset of puberty seems to be okay. They seem to be cycling. Reasonable mating weight's 46, you know. We had a cut-off. Our ethics said we couldn't go under 40. Although, interestingly, for those of you who breed hoggets, there were 12 under 40, and seven of them had cycled by the teaser. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. But our ethics said don't mate them. Mm. Uh, farm staff are happy, which is a good sign. And if you want to see what's going on, you're all welcome to come on the 1st of June come to an open day, 10 kilometres north of Marston, 9.30.
And if you do want to come to that, we need to have a bit of idea of numbers. There's my address. Send me an email if you want to come. More questions? Yeah, go. Steve, you're going to attempt to quantify the um, other associated benefits. You're, you're purely looking at the production stuff. Um, yeah. You know, Jeff Burton up in the King County yeah. director, I'm just going to pay for on, on this. So. Yeah. yeah, and I'm familiar with what Jeff did in, in the, the late... Um, I'm forgetting his name now. Um, no, because it's not... In terms of labour... We can only do we can only do guesstimates. You know, okay, so we can take out the crutching costs, and the modelling did all that, so that it was a labour component, but not on the whole farm because we're not changing the whole flock. You know, and we're not going to record. I don't want to overstate my place on the farm that they have to record every hour they did with this flock versus that flock. Okay, so we're not. Uh, but but Jeff has been involved. The interesting thing about this, we we put out an article and. Well, Peter Burke put an article in the... Where's Peter? What's the name of the paper? I better not say it. I might get it wrong. Rural News. Eh? Rural, News. Rural News. And with my email at the bottom, and I've had 50 people who have farmed Wilshires come back to me. And so that's a good number that hopefully they might come into the field day. So some of you might be in this room. So it's, it's, it's the one piece of trial that we've created that has shown a hell of a lot of interest. Uh, I actually suggested that to MB that they should fund me because of that, but they're busy funding the wool side, aren't they? How often will you be reporting on it? Will you be reporting? Well, to that 40 group, um, hopefully reporting. Reporting on your progress. Yeah, to that 40 group, they are hopefully be getting an email uh, three or four a year. Uh, and... Um, Reporting, I would think uh, anyone that's interested that sends me an email, they'll get a report you know, when the data comes in. So it's probably about this time of the year that there'll be another bit of data. So be, there would be rural press will get an article. Yeah. You know, we've got to be careful. All of these things cost money, you know, like my day here, and you know, no one's fun. The, the last slide. These people have funded us. <laughs> you know, LA Alexander Trust is a Taranaki trust that decided they'd put money in, and they've been brilliant. Uh, Sydney Campbell Trust, which actually owns the Riverside Farm, have, have helped with our travel down there. That's another problem we have as researchers. You know, we're based in Palmerston. To do all those measures, we're down there lambing time every day. <laughs> You've got to travel all the way down to Marston and back. So there's costs involved, and the Massey Foundation has been good. Why not be from land? Yeah, good question. I don't have the answer. <laughs> yeah, in a roundabout way, but um, you know they they, um, they 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 announce when they've got funding for things like this. It probably takes a bit of lobbying from the farmer councils. <laughs> in terms of your sheep and that, how much mess do they make in terms of the wool and stuff? And like, if that wool, you know, it catches wind and that gets stuck in the electric fence, is that going to Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have mentioned that. And um, so in my application to MB, which got turned down, which is why I'm bitter about it, you can, you can tell that MB. <laughs> MB said, no, 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 genomics will deal with it, which is why we've gone to the next one. Um, in that, I put, oh, it's a bit of biodiversity because all oh, the wool disappears. You know, the magpies, the birds take it away. Yeah, yeah. And, well, uh, some people run 10, yeah. 12, 15,000 sheep. Yeah. You know, thinking about commercialising, if you're going to do it properly, you might as well do the whole lot. Yeah, yeah well, you'll have a good bird life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the no, that doesn't say that at all. It disappears. It's, it's amazing, actually. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. It disappears. Ask anyone who's got them. It disappears. It's a big worry. I know it's a worry of, of the traditional farm. You know, you're going to have wool on the fence because they're shaking, and you know that's a sign of lysy sheep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The birds are happy, and the possums, and whoever else. 
Can I just diversify for a little bit? Um, being really old, in the 70s, uh, the wool board brought out an injection. It was actually to do the shearers, uh, make shearing uh, a lot more cheaper. Mm. What's happened to that, and how uh, is any research or fundings going into that? Because that is a slow process, whereas injection's quite instantaneous. But um, um, I, I was aware of that, and, and really, uh, you, you, it was in Australia that it really was most of the research was done, and I don't think it's gone anywhere. Ah. It was a welfare impact, I think. Yeah. It was a, it was a cortisol injection, mm, yeah. and it was very hard yeah. on the animals. Yeah. Was it? Very hard. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Have you considered uh, you, you've got a Romney flock, and then you're grading up the other flock? Mm -hmm. What? Have you considered the comparison? With uh, rather than grading up over time, buying Wiltshire females, and then you instantly at the full, yeah. full breed. You know, is that a comparison? Um, we don't want to compete with all you people who are mad on Wiltshire because you're pushing the price up. So we haven't got any money to go and buy them. But yeah, I mean, if I was a farmer, that's the way I'd go. You know? and, and so many of the people that replied to me said, oh, I've just bought 2,000 tutus. You know, that big sale down in North Canterbury just recently, packed full of people. Like, prices are crazy. So if you've got a big flock, you, you, you can sell your cows for heaps. So we, we don't have the money to do that. But that would be a nice way to go. But you still, this is probably the answer, you know, I mean, you, there might be some good things in the maternal side in the grading up that you want to keep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you, we go the molecular, if we get genomics done, we get molecular breeding values, then, but it's, it's some time off getting the, you know, the, getting the phenotypes and that and collecting all that. Take five years of phenotypes. Yeah, five years of phenotypes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't have anything on that, though, except they're all fed the same. Sorry, they all have the chance to eat the same because they're in the same paddock, except for mating. And so, therefore, any production differences come out must be improved improve utilisation of feed. But, it, you know, there's not very big production differences in the first cross so far. Yeah. Yeah, everyone is. I know. What happens if all is five dollars next year? <laughs> I think it's got to go higher than five, though, doesn't it? It's a bit like the the lamb price, you know, got down low and let's get a hundred, and people talked to hundred and fifty. It had to go up. Steve, how can those who are there help? Sorry. Are you getting enough help out of the industry of people who? Already there with full, with oh, I, the answer is yes. You know, lobbying. I was serious about lobbying. You know, you know this this should be funded if you think it's good. Um, come to our field day. Maybe there's someone from Beef and Lamb there that day. Maybe there's someone from MB who turned us down. <laughs> I know it'll sound like heresy, but the, the big worry is what happens if the wool guy does turn around. Yeah. So what people want to know is how quickly you can breed wool back on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yep. But all I would say to that is I've been out in Western China and that's where 30% of the world's cotton's grown. And that area ain't getting any smaller and they can grow cotton like cotton. And that price is not going to change much. It's not going to go up. So you've still got the competing fibres. I 
Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Steve, for your time and, and discussion. Um, you had a lot of questions there. So, um, yeah, I know it's definitely sparked a lot of interest with a lot of farmers. And, um, yeah, no doubt everyone will be following uh, the trial with a lot of interest. So, thank you.